how uh, instructive your word is to us, how it how it challenges us, how it convicts us, how it instructs us. And I pray that you'd help us tonight to to allow your word to to be like uh, that sword in our lives you want to be, to to uh, take away the things that, that should not be there and to encourage us to uh, put in things that should be there. Help us, God, tonight to see what you want us to have in our lives and not have in our lives as followers of Christ. And I ask it in his name. Uh, we, we've come to a paragraph in Hebrews that it really can be lifted out of the book and put anywhere else in the scripture, and it makes sense. Uh, this paragraph is kind of a standalone paragraph. It's some instruction to these Christians um, that, the writer, that the writer was writing to that uh, just tells them how to live their lives. Um, and in fact, he says there are some things that God wants you to have in your life and some things God wants you to have out of your life. And we're going to look at those those things tonight. Verse 14 of Hebrews 12 says, uh, gives us two things to, to pursue, to put in our lives. And then verses 15, 16, and 17 mention three things to take out of our lives. So we're going to look at the things to put in first and the things to take out next. Um, all of you are aware, obviously, of the phrase mission statement. Um, Every, every organization, every corporation, uh, every church, basically most churches anyway, uh, most nonprofit corporations, organizations have a mission statement that describe you know, who they are, and what they're about. Uh, I, read, I read this week that, that one consultant, one business consultant suggests that a well-written mission statement should be able to say in 30 seconds or less, the story of the organization. Whoever reads that mission statement should know in 30 seconds or less what the organization is about, why it exists. I, I plan to go online today and, and just pull out some mission statements of well-known companies that you would you would know about. But I said instead, I'm gonna I'm gonna read you the mission statement of a organization that we're all familiar with. It's it's Para Peru, the 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 nonprofit that we put together to support Lauren Robertson in Peru. And I just picked this because uh, I helped write it. And it just it just says what the organization is about. And it's an example of what a mission statement is. I'm sharing this for a reason. We'll get to it in a minute. But here, here's what this one says. It says, Para Peru exists to provide resources and encouragement to, and here are three things, to share the good news of Jesus with the people in Peru, to train Peruvians to share the good news of Jesus, and to meet the physical and emotional needs of Peruvians in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, a concise bullet point statement of why that organization exists. And I say all that because if you were asked to write a mission statement for a Christian, I wonder how you would write it. And, and actually, Hebrews 9, uh, 12, 14 would be a great starting point. Uh, it's, it's a single verse that tells what we're to be about as followers of Christ. So look what it says in Hebrews 12, 14. It says, pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now, notice that the first word in that verse is the word pursue. Some Bibles translate that word strive for. Some Bibles say follow after. But the word was used in ancient times to describe a hunter that was tracking a prey. And, and the word carries the idea of intensity, of determination. And as we as we live our lives in this world as followers of Christ, we are to doggedly pursue these two things that are mentioned in this verse. So look what he says. First, he says we should pursue peace with all people, with all men. Now, that first part of verse 14 could be a, a whole lesson by itself. We could spend the, the whole time tonight seeing what the Bible says about living in peace with, with each other in the body of Christ. Yeah. You know, some people. Let me back up for that. We live in a world where it seems like conflict between people is intensified. Maybe it's because the, the media is so prevalent now, maybe because of social media. But it just seems like in, in our world, there, there's always people at each other's throats. There's always this group and this group, and, and, and they always seem to be butting heads with each other, always seem to be in conflict. And, and there are people in our world, and I, I'm sure you've, you've met some of these, who seem to go out of their way to be upset 
and to be uh, in conflict with, with someone in their lives or some group in their lives. Uh, they're, they're not happy unless they have an enemy that they're combating with in, in this world. Now, that, that's not the way God wants Christians to live. He doesn't want us to be uh, people who generate conflict unnecessarily. Our, our main goal, uh, or one of our goals, I should say, our, our aim should be to be at peace with other people. Now, you know, obviously, peace is a two-way street. Uh, it, it's not possible for two people to, to live in peace if one insists on being belligerent. Uh, the, the life of Jesus is a good example of that. I mean, Jesus uh, was peaceful toward all people, but all people weren't peaceful toward him. And you, you see the conflict between him and the religious establishment intensified as, as his ministry went on. And it culminated, obviously, in his, his death on the cross. But, but the Bible tells us in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with, with all men. Now, we only control one side of the peace process. We don't, we don't control both sides. We can't control how other people act toward us or how they, they feel toward us. However, that doesn't mean that if some person is, is angry or mean-spirited or belligerent or hateful toward us, that that gives us the right to react to them in that exact same way. That, that's not what Christians are to do. I want to read you a quote from MacArthur's commentary on Hebrews on this verse. I think he, he says it well. He says, we cannot use another's belligerence as an excuse for our responding in kind. We have an obligation to live peaceably, whether or not those around us treat us peaceably. If they do not live peaceably, that is their problem, but it is never our excuse. Now, uh, sometimes we can stir up strife by attempting to put down strife. I think I, I told you uh, some time ago in another context, a, a legend about, about Hercules. Uh, in, in this legend, Hercules is walking down a path, and he comes across this strange animal, one he's never seen before. And the animal is blocking his path in a very threatening manner. So Hercules takes his club and strikes the animal, and the animal flees. He walks down the path a little further, and the animal reappears a little bigger than it was the time before. And again, it blocks the path. It is belligerent. It is threatening. Hercules takes his club, hits the animal, and the animal flees. A little while further down the path, the animal comes back even bigger the third time. And this goes on time and time again until a heavenly messenger appeared to Hercules and said this, the monster you are meeting on this path in this path is strife. And as you strike that monster, you're just stirring it up. You're making it worse. If you just let it alone, it will shrivel and die and cease to bother you. Now, while it's certainly true that we shouldn't stir up strife intentionally as Christians, we, we shouldn't go out looking for a fight. Uh, we shouldn't have a chip on our shoulder all the time. To, to live in peace with all people, I think, means a, a lot more than just not stirring up trouble. Uh, in, in the scripture, the, the main word for peace means a whole lot more than just the absence of conflict. It, it, it means it, it doesn't mean just living in, in, in cold aloofness toward others. It carries the idea of, of desiring uh, wellness of being, fullness of being, wholeness for those we come in contact with. And so to live in peace with others really means to live in a way that seeks the best for other people. Um, we, we studied earlier this year, or last year, I think it was now, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And, and in, in the first part of the sermon, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And then later on in that sermon, he describes or he explains what it means to be a peacemaker. Uh, and, and it's more than just you know being good friends with those who think like us. Uh, someone look in your Bible at Matthew chapter 5 and read verses uh, 38 through the middle part of verse 45. Uh, I think these verses are instructive on, on helping us to understand 
what it means to pursue peace with all men. So, so Matthew 5, verses 38 through 45, the middle part of that verse. Someone, someone have that? I've done it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Bill, go ahead, Bill. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I said, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to the other also. And if someone wants to use you, wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Yeah. Yeah. How, how's that? How do those those words how does that make you feel about about the world in which we live? I mean, I mean, is that even possible in our world? Can, can we do that? I believe that we have deteriorated to the point where we have nothing but victims. Everybody wants to be a victim. If it wasn't for you, I would this, that, or the other thing. And I don't see in this thing, if you are a non-victim, that, you know, unless you're a victim, why or feel a victim, I don't know why you'd feel animosity towards somebody. Because, you know, I, that's just my feeling. Yeah. And I certainly don't feel like a victim. I've been blessed my entire life. Right, right. And don't we, don't we tend to demonize those with whom we disagree? Um, yeah. it, 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 you know, so somebody, uh, so, go ahead. I thought someone was going to say something. You know, it, it, it always bothers me. I, I, I saw a sign the other day uh, on a car. I was getting gasoline at the Kroger over here by our house. And there's this car, and I, 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 I almost just prejudged by the type of car the person drives, by the temperatures on it, and by how the person looked, you know, where that person, you know, is intellectually and, and all that. But the, the bumper sticker on the car, one of them said, love conquers hate. And, and, I, and I, I so want to ask that person, what do you mean by love and what do you mean by hate? And, and because in, in our in our culture, most people equate love with those who agree with me and hate with those who disagree with me. Uh, if you disagree, if you have a different stance on, on, a, on an issue uh, that I have, you must be a hateful person. Uh, that, that word is just thrown around so easily now. And we tend to demonize those with whom we have different points of view. And I, I think one thing this verse is saying to us is, you know, don't, don't demonize people. Um, it, it's, we can disagree. We can have different ideas. Um, but but you, 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 don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't make people demons. And, and I, I hear so, so often, especially in, in the media day, you know, if you don't, if you're not with me, you're with evil. It's, it's, it's kind of the, it's kind of the dichotomy that's set up there. And, and Christians need to be careful not get caught up in that. It doesn't mean we don't have values or morals, um, stances. We, we, we do, but we have to express them in a way that, that doesn't alienate those with whom we disagree. And, and we need to learn to disagree with those. I mean, uh, agree with those that disagree with us and learn to accept it. Well, or accept disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, yeah. It, but the, the problem is, and, and, and it's, it's almost like it's impossible now to even talk about an issue because it becomes about, you know, you know you're okay. evil and I'm not, or I'm evil and you're not. We don't say I'm evil and you're not, but you know, you know what I mean? We, 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 we never, we, we somehow demonize those who, who are different from us. And, and I, 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 I dislike, I almost said I hate, I dislike how the word hate is bandied about in our culture today. Because it, 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 I hear it constantly. It, you know, you're, you're being a hater because you, you're you against a certain thing that I'm for. And you can fill in the blanks there. And, and well, you know, But, you know, probably, uh, I don't, I think it's because we each have traveled a different road. We we each have, uh, I mean, we're same, from the same culture, but you weren't brought up the way I was, and I'm sure Doug was brought up differently than either of the two of us were, and so forth. Each of us is heard. So we're looking at something as from our experience. I remember being in Japan in 1957, and the Japanese girls were trying to dress like Americans, 
And it didn't make them more attractive. I didn't find them more attractive. I felt they looked better in their own culture's dress than what they did trying to be something they weren't, you know. And it was a different culture, but I, I just, uh, we were coming from different places, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, I, I was watching a TV show earlier today, um, and there was a discussion about, you know, um, um, trans kids playing in women athletic, athletics. That's the big issue you, you're uh -huh. you about. And, you know, one person was saying, if you're against that, that means you're transphobic. You either fear trans people or you hate trans people, which which, no. it, 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 which makes it impossible for you then to say, I'm against that without without feeling like an evil person. That That's the kind of thing that shuts down discussion, shut I think. That, that's, and, and, and the other side does that, and sometimes we Christians do it as well. I mean, we we, we need to pursue peace where we can, uh, without without compromising our our values in, in the process. That that I think that's the point of this. And and, and our lives are better. You know, our our lives are better if if we're we, we're not in conflict with people all the time and not fighting people all the time. It makes us better, and certainly the lives of those around us better as well. That's that's one thing here. Now that's that's just one side of the Christian life, though. The other side is we're to pursue holiness before God. The Christian life has two dimensions that we talked about before. There, there's there's the the vertical us and other people. There's a horizontal. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the horizontal us and others, and the vertical between between us and God. And the second part of this verse talks about that that vertical relationship. It, it says we're to, we're to pursue the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now. That, that word sanctification, the one that the writer uses to describe this vertical relationship, is it, not a word that that we use in our everyday vocabulary. We, yeah, you know, I, I, I can't think of a of a setting where I use that word except just in a in a Bible study group or or in a, in a church group somewhere. But it's one of the great words of of, of the New Testament that we need to really understand. Uh, the the root of that word is is from the same word family is the word holy. And, and the word really means to be set apart, uh, to be to be different. Uh, I, I want to read to how, how one writer describes that word. He, say, he says the person or the Christian who has this quality must always in one sense be different from the world and separate from the world. His standards are not the world's standards. His conduct is not the world's conduct. His ideals are different, his reward is different, and his aim is different. And the basic idea behind that word sanctification in this context here is living a godless life, a godly life, as opposed to a worldly life. Um, Westcott, who's one of the great Greek, well-known Greek scholars and done a lot of work in the Greek New Testament, um, says the word means to live in such a way as to prepare us for the presence of God. And if you look at the last part of verse 14, uh, where, it, where it says, without this quality, no one will see the Lord, that that's really what the word is talking about. The, the point is that, that our actions, our, our thought processes, the, the decisions we make, the priorities we have, uh, all, all, the, all these things, um, must be governed by the knowledge that as Christians, our destiny is to enter the very presence of God. Uh, we're preparing ourselves for, for that moment. Now, don't, don't misread this verse. It, it, it's not saying that we earn the right to enter God's presence by living a, a sanctified or a set apart or, or holy life. If that's, if that's our hope of entering God's presence, we, we have no hope because we can't live you know, a, a life that is that is without without sin. But the Bible makes that makes that very clear. Uh, we, we're sanctified. That is, we're made holy in God's eyes, not because of what we do, but because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. See, it, it's it's a conferred uh, holiness that's given to us by God's grace. It, it's it, it's not something we earn, but but once we receive this holiness, uh, our our aim in life, our our desire. Our goal should be to live in a way that that our, our life in this world prepares us to live in God's presence in the next world. We're in God's presence now, but but as Paul says, we, we see dimly, you know, 
it, 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 through a haze, and then we'll see we'll see face to face. So so we're to pursue peace with people, but we're also to pursue holiness with God. And actually, those two things go together. Uh, I'm not sure you could have one without the other. Uh, if we're at war with people, we're probably at war with God too. Uh, and, and you have to have both those things, I think, to to uh, do what this verse tells us to do. Now, I, I like how how this paragraph begins with with the positive. Uh, you know, here are things you, you put in your life: you know, the peace and sanctification. But that's not all there is to to the life that God calls us to. There are also some things to take out of our lives. And in verses 15, 16, and 17, tell us three things to avoid. We have two things to pursue, but now here, here are three things to avoid. Look, look at verse 15 just for a minute. The, the first word in verse 15, uh, my Bible translates the word with three words. It, the NASB says, see to it. Um, that's, a, I think, a weak translation of this particular word. The, the King James says, looking diligently. And, and I really think that is that is a, a better translation. Um, you know, pursue like a hunter pursuing a prey, peace and sanctification. But also very diligently, very carefully avoid these things. And if you look at, the, at verse 15, 16, and 17, uh, many verses 15 and 16, You'll see after that first word, the, the one that's translated see to it or looking diligently, there are three phrases that each begin with the word that in the in the New American Standard Bible. They, they begin with the word lest in the King James Bible. And, and here's what he says. You know, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See to it that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. And then verse 16, see to it that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. Now, what's, what's he saying here? Um, first, I think he's saying we should diligently avoid being spiritually lazy. Um, that, that phrase, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God is, is a really interesting phrase. Now, now some interpreters look at that and they see the phrase grace of God, and they assume this phrase is referring to salvation. And they're saying it means see to it that no one comes short of salvation. Now, while it's possible, I think, for a person to be exposed to the gospel, uh, for a person to uh, intellectually accept the, the facts of the gospel and, and fail to, to make a life-changing commitment to Jesus Christ, I don't think that's what this verse is talking about. That, that I don't think that's the thrust of, of uh, Hebrews uh, 12, 15. Uh, this verse needs to be interpreted in the context of, of Hebrews. Hebrews is not written to unbelievers. It's written to believers. Uh, at, at issue here is not whether or not a person is a Christian. The assumption of this letter is that the readers are Christians. That's who he's writing to, these Hebrew Christians. At issue is the, the level or the depth of one's commitment to Christ, the, the commitment of these Christians. And, and the, 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 the word translated comes short there, what it means to lag behind or to fail to keep up. When, when, I, when I read that, I, I think about taking groups to Israel. Some of you, several of you in this group have been on trips to Israel. Invariably, on every trip, I've gone eight or nine, ten times, like we've kind of lost track now. But every, every trip, there's one, sometimes two people who always lag behind the group. You, know, you, have, you have to, you know, you have to keep them, keep them moving and keep, get, 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 get them to catch up. They, they just get distracted and, and they they want to see everything and, and they, they don't stay with the group. And, and, and so, so they're, they're lagging behind. And, and that's that way he's talking about here. Uh, in your, in your spiritual life, uh, don't, don't fall behind. Don't, don't fail to, to keep up. Um, I, I think that's the main thing that he's he's talking about uh, in this. Don't don't be don't be spiritual lazy, uh, lagging behind in in your dedication to Christ means really losing interest in things of God, uh, becoming you know, half hearted, becoming lazy, becoming indifferent uh, in in our spiritual walk. And he says, just you know, be sure and diligently avoid that. Now. 
having said that, he, he, he takes it a step further. There, there is but a way of regression in, in, in these, these three things. He says, don't just not lag behind, but also avoid being a corrupting influence on other people. Uh, don't be someone who drags other people down. That's the basic idea behind that phrase in verse 15, where he says, see to it that no root of bitterness uh, springing up causes trouble that it may be defiled. The, the phrase root of bitterness comes from Deuteronomy 29. Uh, that's where Moses uh, talked about the Israelites who, who forsook God and, and turned to other gods. He, he described them as a root bearing poisonous fruit. But they didn't just forsake God themselves. They also attempted to get other people to forsake God. Thus, thus, root of bitterness means a, a corrupting influence on others, uh, a contaminating influence on other people. Uh, someone who drags other people down, spreads doubt, spreads wickedness, spreads discord among God's people. Now, the Bible is really clear about us avoiding people like that. Uh, you know, we, don't, we don't live in a vacuum. You know, we, 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 you know, our actions, our, our attitudes, our words always influence other people. And we, we as believers must be careful not to be a corrupting influence, a negative influence on those around us. So someone, someone look up uh, Matthew 18, 7, and read that verse to us, Matthew 18, 7. Uh, it's a, it's a, a statement Jesus made that relates directly to what's being said in, in this verse in Hebrews 12. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and my Bible talks about, you know, woe to the world uh, because of stumbling blocks. And that, that's what he's saying here. Don't, don't be a stumbling block to other people. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 14, there's a great discussion about how we shouldn't allow our freedom in Christ and, and how we choose to live our lives to, to become an obstacle or a stumbling block to our brother. Um, we're to be those who, who build others up by our presence, not, not tear them down. There's a, there's a wonderful story, uh, a great statement really, about, about the, the only time that, that Woodrow Wilson, who became president of the United States, uh, came into contact with Dwight L. Moody, the, the well-known preacher of uh, early in the in the uh, 20th century, and I, I want to read this, this. This is this this paragraph I'm going to read is from a biography of, of Moody, but it's quoting Woodrow Wilson about about his his first contact and only contact with, with Moody. I want you to I want you to hear what he says here. He's, this is this is Woodrow Wilson talking now. I was in a barber shop when I became conscious that someone unusual entered the room. A man had come in quietly was seated in a chair next to mine. Every word he uttered showed a personal and vital interest in the one who was serving him, though he was not the least bit formal or pompous. Purposely, I lingered until after he left and noted the singular effect his visit had on the barbers in that shop. Their conversation was quiet and subdued. They did not know his name, but somehow his presence had elevated their thoughts and impress them greatly, and that that's the that, that's the kind of uh, influence or, or impact I think that that we as Christians should have. Instead of being a a corrupting influence, we all we all strive to be a positive spiritual influence on those around us. And and then and then the, the third thing here is we we should diligently seek to avoid focusing just on life in this world. The, the first part of verse sixteen. Uh, talks about Esau, and he says, see to it that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. And, and the basic idea is we're not to make the same mistake that Esau made. Now, now, what was Esau's mistake? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know the story of how in Genesis 25, when, when Esau was hungry and, and he came in, he sold his birthright uh, to his brother for, for a bowl, bowl of stew, stew. Uh, he, he thought so little of the promise that God gave to his grandfather Abraham and to his father Isaac that that he was the heir to as the eldest son that he gave it up for for just a, a bowl of stew and, and and the verse describes Esau as a godless person 
And, and what that means is he, he was a secular person. Uh, he, he put things of the world over things of God. He put the, the secular over the sacred, the physical over the spiritual. Uh, he, he, he put the way of the world over the, over the way of God. And, and one way I put it this way, he, said, he says, this, this, this phrase, godless person, describes the person whose mind recognizes nothing as higher than earth, for whom there is nothing sacred, who has no divine reverence of the unseen. A godless life is a life without any awareness of or interest in God. Now, when we're controlled by a secular mentality. Uh, when we, we live only for, for material gain and not spiritual prosperity, we are repeating the, the mistake of Esau. And, and the command here is for Christians to avoid that kind of life. Uh, while we live in this world, uh, as, as the scripture says in several places, we're not of this world. Uh, this is not our, our, should not be our primary focus. We must never forget that there's, there's more to who we are than just our time on this earth. And, and if, you know, if you, if you think that this world is all there is, uh, and, and there's there's nothing beyond this life, um, that, that that really makes life almost meaningless in this world. I mean, there, there's no basis for any kind of, of uh, moral decision making. Uh, there, there's no hope, but we, beyond the time that we're here, um, it, it is a grim kind of life to to to, to view life that way. And and what he's saying here is we we must never forget that we're citizens of a spiritual kingdom of a heavenly kingdom, and we should focus our, our lives on, on, on that, not just on this world in which we're living right now. Now, no, notice the regression here in, in this process. Uh, we become spiritually lazy. That, that's, the, that's the first part. We, we, we just begin to, you know, be slack in our spiritual life. Then we, then we become a bad influence for those around us. And then we reject or we, we fail to, to understand and appreciate the spiritual dimension of life. So, so those are things to avoid. So when you look at this whole picture here, uh, we, we pursue peace. We pursue sanctification, you know, uh, a, a, a right living with God. We reject spiritual laziness. We reject, reject being a stumbling block. And, and we reject uh, uh, living just for, for this world. And take it as a whole, this paragraph really is, is a good example of, uh, or a good explanation of how God wants his people to live in this world. Okay, what do you see in that? Any, and we've discussed some things here, but what do you see in the paragraph that you find uh, challenging to you or, or encouraging to you? Well, it's a good way to live. Yeah. And, and why, do you, why do you suppose God tells us to live this way? It's the only way to have peace. Okay, so you have peace, yeah. I mean, the triumph of harmony. You, you know, everything that God instructs us to do and to be and to avoid is for our benefit. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's that, that's the whole point. When you realize that God made us and He loves us, He wants us to have the best life we can possibly have. It, it, he, doesn't, he doesn't tell us to, to avoid certain things or do certain things to restrict us. He tells us to, to free us, to, to make life as, as full as it should be. The, the best example of that is, is how a parent, a loving parent, cares for a child. You know, you know, a child may think that you're being harsh with them or being mean with them, when, when, when in fact you're shaping their lives for their good. And that's what that's what God does to us. So, so when you go to the scripture and you read about you know, God says, you know, pursue these things and avoid these things. It's not arbitrary. He, he's doing that because he made us and, and he wants us to, to have the best life we could possibly have. And, and, and when you look at his instructions that way, it, it kind of, it, it, they don't become burdensome then. Uh, it, it's, it's not a burden. It, it, it's, it's, it's a joy to, to live like God wants you to live because it makes your life better. And, and so that's, that's what I see in this paragraph is, is God's, you know, God's uh, blueprint for making life better. And that, that's how he wants us to live. Okay. What else you see there? Anything else? 
Okay, we exhausted that. So <laughs> that's good. Okay, okay we we uh, we're going to meet next week, uh, as far as I know, and then the next week, Carolina will be out of town for 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 uh, a week. So we'll be here next week and miss the following week, and then pick up after that. And we're we'll next next time we meet next week, we'll probably finish chapter twelve of Hebrews. I think we can do the last paragraph, eighteen through twenty nine, all in one big chunk because it's it's dealing with one idea there. So we'll we'll look at that next week and then uh get chapter thirteen and we'll be done with this book, you know, before this year's over. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> the only way. So, yeah.